Thank you, guys. So, it is 916. You weren't kidding. <laughs> Most churches, you're closing, you're wrapping up right around now. If you're visiting, there was visitors, wasn't there, Chris? If you're visiting, welcome to Redemption House Life Center. I came here once and I came back. <laughs> so there's hope for you to maybe come back. <laughs> I was. I was here before. And, then, and here I am again. So, <laughs> so I'm not surprised by much. <laughs> they kept saying, you, you are going to get the mic. I'm like, I never really expected to get the mic. <laughs> They kept saying, Tracy's in a rare mood. I'm thinking, that's Tracy. Like, that's all I've ever seen. Like, she's not in a rare mood. That's Tracy. <laughs> Visitors, did I tell you I've been here before? And I came back. Amen. No, I thought of something when I walked in here. It really touched my heart. So now I get a little serious, but. I've been coming here a long time. I've been in a lot of places multiple times over the years. Like you don't go back for a while. Then you go back here. It's so close. I just, we have a relationship. I've come down for this 4th of July thing a lot. But I I noticed this when I came in. And uh, I didn't mean to get emotional about it. But you have a core of people. There is faces here. A lot of faces here. That were here ever since I've been coming. And I don't know if you know how rare that is. There was something special about it. When I, saw, I looked around the room today when I first walked in. and There's so many people that were here when I first started coming. That's super rare. I'm not even sure totally why I'm acknowledging other than you guys are sticking together, running together. We're to strive together for the faith of the gospel. People get hurt, offended. They get antsy. They get restless. They say it ain't the same as it used to be. People find reasons to not be somewhere for a long time. You guys have a whole, whole lot of people that have been here the whole time I've been coming. And I don't know. Just something grabbed my heart about that today. So, so stay engaged. Let's go after God. It's just, it's just beautiful. Uh, what was the fellow's name that did the testimony? Femi. Femi. He said, you said something that really grabbed me, so I think I might have spring off of it and just preach. <laughs> Got to preach something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was kind of looking, thinking, what are we going to do? No. <laughs> no, this way, if it doesn't work, it's Femi's fault. <laughs> 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 so, so if this doesn't work, no, he said something that really touched me. He kept saying about Pastor David and what emanated out of his heart, no, his posture of his heart. And he said this, did you catch it? He said, it wasn't to me, it wasn't just something to be admired, but something to become. So good. How many times do we just appreciate things, admire things? Or we just say, wow, that's great. And we almost regulate it for them. Like that's just how they are. And we don't take that step. Funerals, we honor the dead. We honor people that passed. And the greatest thing we can do is become the thing we're honoring. That's the highest way you can remember them. Not just write a book about them and now they're gone and that's their history. No. If it was that honorable, then become it. Multiply it. So let's just go to the highest one. Who's the highest one? Who's the name above every name? Okay. I have a book here. Now, religion doesn't like this. Some circles of theology doesn't like this. And there's a language actually set against it. But I have the language of this book. And I'm going to stick with it. Like Jesus is the name above every name. But this book tells me that he's not just to be admired. That we should become. 
And I want to just show you what this book says for a little bit here. It's late. No, I'm at a redemption house. Visitors, it's late. <laughs> but we can change. Anybody can change. <laughs> I, come, I come down here every year. I, I do. I really do. I, I stay, keep my distance from Tracy. We say hi back in the room. <laughs> I sit on the other side. <laughs> I just don't let her touch me. Don't do it. Stay there. No, don't, don't chase me around the church. I'm faster than you. <laughs> if I need to be. So who knows that Jesus is to be admired? Who knows that it's right to honor him and admire him? He's the name above every name that one day, one day, whether people believed or not, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess like Jesus is the big deal. But yet when I read scripture, he patterned, he lives something that we're supposed to pattern. He modeled something that we're supposed to pursue. And then he, he gave us Holy Spirit. He gave us Holy Spirit to ensure and empower us and ensure that we could, if we're willing, if we believe. Now, religion says, well, that was Jesus. A lot of churches you go to, we'll talk about something and something about Jesus. Like, well, that was Jesus. Yeah, that's it's so terrible, but it's so a language. There's language out there like, well, no, not everybody, nobody can be perfect. Nobody's perfect. And I know what we're trying to say, but why do we feel like we have to say that stuff? The Bible says, be complete as your Father in heaven's complete. Or be there perfect. The word is complete. It's not perfection. Be complete. We still feel like we have to say like it's humility. Well, brother, everybody's going to sin. Well, we all have our moments. Well, everybody has their stuff, brother. I mean, you've heard this language if you've been a Christian for any length of time. As if we all have to have a meltdown. We all have to have a breakdown. There's a thing out there, and, and even in spiritual circles, talks about the dark night of the soul and, and prepares people for it. I'm 28 years saved. I'm still not sure what they're talking about at all. Like, I don't know how I'm going to have a dark night in my soul when light's on the inside. <laughs> so it's just stuff. There's stuff we say that we prepare for or that we... Make place for. So that, and, and, and I really believe it's de a design by the enemy. I really do. Even though well-intended people are saying this stuff, I'm not saying they're demonic. But I believe we're misinformed. Like, like when you preach on righteousness, holiness, when you preach on clean and forgiven and blameless and there's a thing that rises in a lot of people because of what they've heard. Like, yeah, but brother, nobody's perfect. Yeah, but we all have our issues. Yeah, but we're all going to have our... That is, that, is, that is not humility. That is a lack of understanding. Not saying that times that doesn't happen in people, but why are you positioning for something that the Bible says you're to walk above? In other words, when you say, yeah, but that was Jesus, then you can't follow him. But he said, follow me. Amen. So now I'm reduced to needing him, but I can never be anything like him because he's the Lord. And we think that's holy. We think that's right. We think that's humble. But when I read my Bible, it's total deception. Let me get something straight. The Christian life is absolutely impossible. It's impossible to live the Word of God without Holy Spirit. It's impossible to live the Christian life without grace, which is God's empowerment. Grace isn't God's mercy. Don't get them mixed up. A lot of people have grace and mercy mixed up. They think great. They say, boy, I blew up on my wife today. Thank God for His grace. No, no. His grace keeps you from blowing up. 
Mercy comes now that you blew up, but grace changes you. Don't get the two mixed up. Oh, I'm so glad for his grace. His grace is empowerment. If you're glad for his grace, his grace empowers you. If we can't follow him, why do we need empowered? If you can't live the word, why do we need empowered? See, grace, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm sozoed, I'm healed, delivered, protected, preserved, made whole, and kept safe and sound by the grace of God through believing it. If a language comes in that hinders us from believing, grace will be limited and so will we. But if I'm reading this book right, we're not limited unless we fail to see and believe. Now, the only other detriment could be not wanting to. I've met a lot of people that don't want to love. They want to hold on to rights. They want to live the thing that's familiar. You do me wrong, I'm going to react. You know, and whatever. It's like, I, I, you have to want to become love. You have to want to follow Jesus. You, Anybody can want to need him for their circumstances to change, their vats and barns to be full, protection. That, that side's easy, but that's, a, that's barely even a piece of the gospel. You don't come to him for what he can do for you. You come to him for how he can make you more like him. Now, I'm going to show you some scripture, and I want you to see how, like, like Pastor said, oh, that's terrible. When I said, well, that was, yeah, but that was Jesus. I grew up hearing that my whole life. Yeah, but that was Jesus. Yeah, but that was Jesus. So what that does is exempt you from believing that could be anything in your life. But I can show you scripture after scripture after scripture. It's amazing. Even Jesus himself says, if you believe in me, if you believe in me, the things I do, you will do. I mean, that's coming from the Lord. And greater things, because I go to my father, so I don't know that that means greater in, in magnitude in the sense, I mean, Jesus raising the dead, he's doing, he's doing stuff. Does he, mean, does he mean it's because it's going to be in as many as believe? Is, is greater because there's a whole bunch of us that see this? Amen. See, he said it wouldn't be profitable if I didn't go because then he wouldn't come. Holy Spirit wouldn't come to live inside of each one of us. If I just stay here, you got to get to me. And where I am is where God's moving. But if I go, I'll send him and he'll be in as many as would believe. So in other words, he's going to do in Jesus' absence what Jesus would do if he's here. But he'll do it in as many as would believe. So that's a problem for darkness. So if you are a lord over darkness, you would try to turn down the light on that thing and get people to believe a lot of other stuff and maybe admire him, but never become. This is going to work. We're going to take the pressure off you. This is going to be good tonight. Yeah. You ain't getting no blame. This, no, this is going to be good. Go to First John with me real quick. I want you to see something. So first of all, you got to understand as you go into First John, you got to understand the, you know how people say people were wearing hats, different hats. Jesus wore a bunch of hats. I mean, you could list a whole lot of hats. I'm going to list three major hats that Jesus wore. He was the Lamb. Who knows He was the Lamb? Who knows that He came and was made to be sin? Who knew no sin was made to be sin? So I right now could stand right in the sight of God. That I could be actually washed and cleansed through his blood. And God remember my sin no more. Put his life, his spirit, his image, his nature in me because of the lamb. Yeah? So he's my savior. He sinned sacrifice. He didn't sin. He was made to be sin. See, that's how they tricked the devil. So according to the spirit of holiness, Romans 4, Holy Ghost went in there and raised Jesus from the dead. Why? He wasn't guilty of sin. He was a scapegoat. He was made to be sin. In the Old Testament, they would lay hands on the goat and they would, they would believe that all the sins of the people would go into the goat and then they'd take it outside the city into the wilderness knowing it was going to wander and either die of thirst or starvation and die out there believing it was going out with everybody's sins. That's why Jesus died outside the gates. Right. Scapegoat. He took our sins. He took it away. He didn't smooth it over. Took it away. Come on. He gives us new life. 
through Jesus Christ. That's not just a new starting block. Come on. Somebody needs that. You're not just getting to start over. New life. With new life comes a new way. With new wine needs a new skin. Can't put new into old. Can't have the old mentality. Can't have the old motive. Can't have the old why and the reason for being. Everything changes. So the new wine can be contained by the new wine skin. So, so he was our savior. He was our sin sacrifice. He's the lamb. Who knows that? Here's another hat he wore. He said, when you see me, you've already seen who? Bam. It's so good. So when Jesus came, he didn't just come to pay the price to forgive our sin. He showed us who the father is. I mean, that's, that's solid, man. When Jesus said, why do you say, show us the father? I've been with you so long. You have been with me this long. And now you don't even realize that when you see me, you've already seen him. Come on. Hebrew says he's the expressed image of his person, the outraying of his brightness. So Jesus is the revelation of the Father. He said, I only come to do his will. When you see Jesus' life, you see the will of God. It's not a mystery. It's not a hot potato. It's not a scratch your head will of God. The will of God is Jesus' life. Yeah? But here's the one we need tonight. They're all so important. I'm not putting one above the other, but this is the third hat I want to describe. In the process, only Jesus can do this. In the process of modeling the Father, he modeled the life that we were always created to live. He showed us what life looks like empowered by the Holy Spirit, one with God. And he invited us in and didn't just say, sing to me, study me, talk about me. (laughs) Said, follow me. So if Jesus said, follow me, is it possible? But it's amazing my whole life in church, I grew up, well, that was Jesus. Well, that was Jesus. You talk about a healing, well, that was Jesus. You even talk about him forgiving and walking in love. Well, that was Jesus. Nobody can love like Jesus. Well, Ephesians 5.1 says that you should be walking in love as dear children just like Jesus loved. It didn't say somewhat like. It didn't say kind of close to. Ephesians 5.1 says walk in love just as he loved. And gave himself. See, to follow him cost you who you were apart from him. Come on. To follow him will cost you who you are apart from him. Who you are in him is totally different than who you are apart from him. That's why we live in Christ. That's why we're built up in Christ. The in Christ phrases. Established in him, built up in him, as the truth is found in him. So if the truth is found in him, then the truth about me is found in him. So you can't lay a foundation unless it be through Jesus Christ. Corinthians says that he's become the wisdom of God for us. Are you guys with me? He said, follow me. He said, the only way you're going to follow me is if you deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Pick up your cross. That means taxi through life and don't let life ever speak louder than truth because truth is what makes you free. Circumstances, that is not our issue. Living in Christ in the middle of everything we ever face is what we're called to. Living in Christ in the middle of whatever we face. We're not here to believe to face less. We're here to know him and model him. Your testimony touched me. He used a brother who happens to be a pastor who revealed something to him that impressed him. And he said, I saw that it wasn't something to just be admired, but something to become. Come on. Man, when I look at Jesus and the way he loved me, the way he loved you, 
Why wouldn't I want love like that? I don't just want authority. I don't just want power. I don't just want miracles. I want him. And he, he invited me to follow not his power, follow him. So the fact that Jesus said, follow me, tells me it's possible. And because I'm going to believe him, forgive me, love you, I'm not going to believe anything that anybody else is saying. I'm not going to believe the limitations, the phrases, the catchphrases. Well, yeah, but brother, we all have our limitations. Yeah, but you can only, we'll never, we only see in part. We're only as... Are you in First John yet? Yeah. If you're not, we probably won't even try to pray for you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Are you there yet? I gave you a lot of time to get there. This is, I'll just read here verse 5. John chapter 1. Just, I just want to get to one thing that John writes. John, John impresses me. Who knows that John is bold enough when he writes the gospel that he actually says the, or the one, that, the disciple that Jesus loved. Like, John, yeah. Like, that's how John describes himself without bearing witness of himself. He said, I can handle this. It's the one that Jesus loved. It's the disciple that he loved. Woo! That do you good to be there. Wake up every day. Whoa, the disciple Jesus loved. <laughs> Instead of, well, I don't feel his love. I wish there was an order call somewhere in town. I got to get some love. How about just getting up and believing his love? How about just believing the cross? The finished work. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you that God is Whoa. God is what? And light's greater than darkness. So if you look up darkness, it's actually the absence of light. Right? The definition. So light is greater than darkness. That's not rocket science. But we need to look at that and go, why are we all consumed with darkness and how dark? And the darkness and it's getting darker. Come, Lord. When darkness is the absence of light. So darkness can never be the problem. So if darkness is dominating, it's not even because of the darkness. So the darkness can never be the problem. Because light is greater. So you can say, yeah, but my city is so dark. Churches in a four mile radius, and we all Christians. But man, our city's dark. It's the absence of light. Arise, shine, church. See, as soon as you get intimidated by darkness, you lose your, you lose your authority in the light. As soon as you get focused on the wrong thing. Then you get caught up in what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is saying. And the whole time you're doing that, you're not growing up into him in anything. Come on. And you might actually believe your language. You might actually, then you all go and intercede and call it prayer, and it's all problem driven. <laughs> you're just interceding because it's a mess out there. Instead of growing to know him more, to shine in the middle of the mess, to walk in love, to actually walk in authority. You see, darkness can never be the problem. If darkness is the absence of light. Just a thought. Because God is light and in him. Oh. No darkness in him what? At all. And where is he? Yeah, but you know, yeah, but we all, we got our stuff, brother. I mean, come on. See, if I theologically look at this and want to get really straight with my own heart and faith and want to grow and pursue something, who, who knows he's the Lord? Who knows nobody else is going to be the Lord? But why not like father, like son? Why not? 
Why not like, you know, you could have somebody have, have, a, have a child and they ain't been a, a good father and they try and say, I ain't got no kids. I ain't, and, you, and they got this little girl over here saying, that's my daddy. He ain't, he ain't, I ain't got no kids. But when you look at her, she looked just like him. So in the natural, that's how we're like, I think that's her daughter, his daughter. In Christianity, he's our father. We're his children. We can look like him. It has nothing to do with appearance. That's why the room looks so different. This room looks so different. You ought to see it from my point of view. <laughs> we got Redemption House people that know what's going on. We got visitors that are here by faith at 941. <laughs> it's just different. The room's different. No, no. You all look different. Why? Because his image has nothing to do with the way you look. Because God doesn't have a body. He's a spirit. So it's not what he looks like. It's who he is. Is what image is. Image isn't his appearance. It's who he is. So why did he give us all bodies? So we can manifest who he is. So this is the vessel that everything takes place in and through. So I get to act out Christ. I get to live Christ. You know them by their... What's in a man is revealed through a man. So wonder if I get filled with Holy Spirit. Wonder if I actually understand this and get excited about it and get alone and believe and have a willing heart and I actually die to myself. And it ain't just theology. It ain't just a song or an altar call 14 times a year. I wonder if I've actually surrendered. I wonder if I actually believe it's possible to forgive. And not even have a grid for unforgiveness to where I ain't even trying to forgive. Who's ever heard this? Well, back off, brother. You don't know what I've been through. Sometimes it's hard. It just takes time. Ask Jesus if you're right. No, no. Ask Jesus if you're right. Because where did you get that belief? From every other hurting person you've ever been in fellowship with. But you ask Jesus if that's right. Well, brother, sometimes these things take time. No, stop buying time you don't have. You're not even for sale. You can't buy nothing. You can't be bought. You've been bought with a price. You're not your own. I read this book. You have a brother. Chris, it takes time. It takes, sometimes these things take time. You need to be more sensitive to me because you don't know how long it's been, brother. You don't know what I've had to go through. And now you're trying to get them to believe what you believe. Now you're trying to buy them because you've been bought. But you've got to ask Jesus if you're right. Because he don't even know what you're talking about. He don't even know how you got that kind of thinking. Because it ain't nowhere where he's been from the beginning. <laughs> well, you just don't know what I've been through. So talk to somebody that has been through it. Don't get your advice from somebody that don't know. Are you all okay? Yeah. I'm trying to get this in quick. They gave me the mic and I don't do nothing quick. <laughs> it's Redemption House. Just keep saying I'm at Redemption House Life Center. And I'll come back sometime. There's no darkness at all in him. And if we say we have communion and fellowship and koinonia, intimacy and relationship with God... And walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. That's not a slam. That's just sobering. That's convicting. In other words, don't buy into cheap words. Your life revealed, your life lived is what gives away the revelation of your revelation. In other words, the life lived. Look, if you don't love, 1 John 4, a couple of pages later, if you don't love, you don't know him. 
He didn't say you don't see him as your savior. You don't see your need for forgiveness. It doesn't say that you're not saved. You're going to hell. It, ain't, it says if you don't love, you're lacking something. You don't know him like you could. Which means I can't know him and not become like him. He's that amazing and influential. It's relational. The whole goal is knowing him. Paul said, not that I've apprehended. Apprehended what? Knowing him. When you look at Paul, you think he knew him. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Everybody says Paul had the greatest revelation of any man living. And Paul said, oh, that I might know him. I ain't let my birthright, my roots, my born into a Hebrew, Hebrews, Pharisee, I ain't let none of that mean nothing. I'm putting it all away, stepping over here that I might know him. Not that I've apprehended, but I'm pursuing it. Well, Paul, I'm impressed with you knowing him. I want to know him more. He says, not that I've apprehended, but there's one thing I do. One thing, not one of two. Not one of a list, one thing. I just forget what lies behind. Why? Because he ain't back there. He's right here. This has nothing, watch, this back here, and I'm not being insensitive, and I know we've been, it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. In fact, you got to put that away to even start right here. We keep thinking we got a meeting back here, and he's got to come and bring peace back here. Why don't you just call it dead? Why don't you say, man, if they knew him, they wouldn't have touched me like they touched me. If they knew me, they would have never done. They they are lost, and I'm not going to let them be lost. Make me be lost. Or worse yet, I don't know why God let it happen. I thought he loved me. Then why did he let the cross happen? See, maybe you're looking at the wrong place to find his love. Maybe his love is found in sin, trying to reproduce sin and crush your life. Maybe love is found over here where Christ was crucified. You say, well, if God loved me, then why? Well, if God loved me, then how come? Well, how come he and I cried on my bed and why did he still? And if he really loved me? See, I think we ask the wrong questions because there's a way that seemeth right. But that questioning never produced life in anyone. So maybe we ask ask the wrong question. And Jesus never obliged the question when it was asked from a wrong place. You show me one place where he answered a question when they asked in a wrong place. He always said, let me ask you a question. Well, if he really loved me, then why did he? And when I was six, how come? And then I was nine and he, and I laid on my bed and I cried and said, God, don't let it happen. And he let it happen. Come on, this is real stories. So you tell me, how can he love me? Let me ask you a question. If he didn't love you, why did he put Jesus on the cross? See, maybe we're trying to find love in the wrong places. And we're trying to bring him to those places instead of come out of the darkness into the light. Come out from among them and be separate. Be delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of the son of his love. Put off the this freedom fest. Watch. Not being smart. Cynical. Put off the put on the it's not a feeling. It's truth. It's not an emotion. It's truth. Put on the new. Forget. Accept it. Clean. Holy. Blameless. Above reproach. In his sight. See what's wrong with me? I believe that for a long time now. So because I believed it for a long time now. I believe it more than I've ever believed it. Why? That I might. No, not that I've apprehended. But I'm pressing on. Why? 
So I lay a hold of that which he laid a hold of me for. That sure beats just praying for blessing, protection, provision. I've never seen anybody blessed and run well just believing for blessing. But if I lay a hold of that which he laid a hold of me for, and realize it's God working in me both to will and do for his good pleasure. Therefore, I do all things without grumbling or complaining. What? So that I can be seen as a harmless, innocent child. Watch. Religion won't let this fly without fault. So I could be seen as an innocent, harmless child without fault in the eyes of a twisted generation. Well, oh, brother, we all have our moments. What are you saying? You're perfect. You're freaking me out now. You're borderline heresy right now, brother. In fact, you ain't borderline. You stepped over the line. I'm just quoting scripture. So I can be seen as an innocent, harmless person without fault in the midst of a twisted and perverse generation whom shining forth as a... See, darkness is never the problem. Shining forth as a light, holding forth the word of life. Are you all with me? So if we walk in darkness and we lie and don't practice the truth, but watch this. But if we walk... Oh, John, come on. You can't mean this. John, see, you know, men wrote the Bible. <laughs> you ever hear it? And there's so much contradiction, and here you are following a book written by men. <laughs> Give me permission to do whatever I want, whatever I feel, and if I don't agree, I just shift and find a reason to not. <laughs> well, men must have wrote this. Because look what John wrote. Do you believe the word of God was written by the Holy Spirit through men? So you believe it's infallible and incorruptible and unchanging? Okay. But if we walk in the light somewhat like he's in the light. Not something to just appreciate, something to become. Man, I just appreciate the purity of Jesus. I appreciate his motives, the mind of Christ, how he never wavered or dropped the cross and complained. There wasn't a straw that could break his back. I so admire the Lord. Let's just worship him for the next six hours because he's worthy. That's one thing. But becoming what you appreciate is his goal. Walk in the light. How? As he, without exception, same light, same walk. So if you believe in me, the things I do, you'll do. Not just talking about miracles, talking about love, forgiveness, mercy, patience, endurance. We're always thinking miracles. Look at this next chapter, chapter 2. You don't have to go far. Verse 6, chapter 2. He who says he abides in him. Oh, I just love the Lord. I'm just living in the Lord. He who says he abides in him ought to walk even as somewhat like he walked. So this two chapters in a row. John is either writing by Holy Spirit or John needs to be set down and corrected. And every teacher and preacher in the world needs to Deal with this and say, am I teaching this or am I teaching our human frail experience as truth? Or am I allowing grace to bring change to my life? Or am I stopping grace by saying, well, yeah, but we all, yeah, I know he wrote that, but everybody, brother. See, we're not following everybody. We're following him. So when does he really get the honor of our faith? Or surrender. Come on. We well, yell, yeah, but brother, we all have our moments. We're not following all. We're following him. I'm glad he didn't have his moments. 
You ever see Jesus just bummed out because of people? Anyone who says he abides in him ought to what? Look, all I'm doing is reading scripture. This isn't my sermon. Ought to himself also to walk just as he walked. So in 1 John, in the light, as he's in the light. 2 John, or John, 1 John chapter 2, I mean, abide in him and walk even as, just as he walked. Let's look at chapter 3. John's on a roll. So he's either a heretic, he's either hypo-spiritual and needs to chill and relate and keep it relatable, brother. Get real. See, that's what I like about you, brother. You keep it so real. You just relate. You keep it down to earth. Preach all this high stuff. Impossible to live, making everybody feel bad because they ain't living it. <laughs> Whoever heard this kind of preaching and language? <laughs> and then people say, Oh, yeah, that makes me feel better. How's that transforming your life? It's giving you permission to live what you're not even here to live. And then that's subverting the grace that's here to actually change you and empower you to live different if you'll step over and believe. Not try harder, believe. That's right. Come on. It's impossible to live the Christian life. You go try to live Matthew, the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 6. You go try to live the Beatitudes and take a score at the end. The Beatitudes, the attitudes of being. It's impossible to live the Sermon on the Mount. But with the person of Holy Spirit, all these scriptures say, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. Religion says, no, that was Jesus. He's saying, follow me. And the things I do, you'll do if you. So if you were the enemy, what would you attack? The belief system of the church. And get us to put four churches on four corners because we all believe something different. Look at, look at chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Woo! Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We know that when He is revealed. Now see, somebody will take a scripture like this and then they'll say, well, see, we ain't all the way there yet. And then they'll exempt themselves from following him just as he loved, just as he walked in the light as he's in the light. So then you say, yeah, but brother, now we just see in part. We don't have the full revelation. When he comes, we'll see him as he is. Well, if I could take that truth, the more I see him as he is, the more I can be like him. So what people do is they wait till that day. They put transformation on hold. You know how people do this stuff? They're living with something in their life and instead of getting real with it and going after it and confessing it to a brother and crying over it, not in condemnation, in conviction and saying, man, my life has to be more than this thing. They'll just say, well, God knows my heart. And for some reason, that gives permission to buy time. Well, God loves me. He knows my heart. No, he knows your life. In that day when we stand before him, this isn't harsh. In that day we stand before him, it says we'll be judged for the things we've done. Not the things we theologically agreed with. Our life is what will be seen. Are you with me? Watch this. This is incredible. So we know that when this is a big one, when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he So that's just the fuller revelation. What was Paul pursuing? That I might chill Paul. You already know him more than anybody else. No, I want to know him. He said, and I want everybody to have the same mind and the same faith. No matter how mature you are, no matter how you think you're immature, everybody, no matter where you've arrived, 
you have the same mind. That's what he said in Philippians 3. Watch this. So we're going to see him, and we're going to be like him. Look at verse 3. And everyone, not most, not some, everyone who actually has this hope and actually believes this is true and actually sees this and and that day's coming and watch, not getting over aggressive and militant, just speaking Bible. Every step I'm taking, every breath, every tick of the clock is taking me closer to the day I stand before him. It's just real. You can ignore it. You can get busy. You can just do church and not be her and just pass time. But every step is taking me closer to that day I stand before him. He who has this hope in him. Here's the barometer that you have the hope. Purifies himself even as he is pure. We have been so, our innocence has so been shattered in this purity thing that we're not even sure anybody doesn't have some kind of motive attached to everything. Like what's in it for you? We've been so jaded by impurity that I'm not sure we actually believe what the gospel's even saying. The gospel's taking a giant leap forward and saying, no, no, I'm not just talking about clean up your act. I'm saying purify yourself even as he's pure. No, no. That, like, are you hearing this? That means, that means in my heart as a surrendered Christian, when you ain't looking and I'm over here with him, seeking him and yielding and putting off and putting on, I want to follow him. I believe it's possible. I don't want awe in my heart. I don't want a motive that doesn't glorify you or see people through your eyes. God, and I'm here exchanging. When nobody's looking. Why? Because to the pure all things are pure. And blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. We all say we want to see him. Let's just get pure. He's not doing anything wrong. He's just sharing his experience from when we've gotten to know each other in my heart and coming here and the way I've conducted things. I believe it's pure. It shouldn't be an enigma. It shouldn't be rare. You know the number one compliment I've gotten from people in my life that know me for a length of time? They say, you know what I love about you? And I'm like, I'm, I'm afraid to hear it. I, I say, what? You're just so real. It's a sad day when the best compliment a Christian could get is you're real because we've been so unreal. Because when they say, because you're so real, I'm like, I just feel like I want to say, so what are you? Are you some kind of coffee additive, half and half? Like, kind of in, kind of not? Like, what are you? Why is it a compliment? It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy that it needs highlighted. It should be every one of us in the room. We wake up for one reason, to bring him glory. We go through what we go through for one reason, so he might be known. We don't just admire him. We want to become like him. Yeah? John says it, or Paul says it this way in Galatians. Chapter 2, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm still living. I died, but I'm alive. I died, but I'm alive. But the life that I'm living, I now live by the faith of the Son of God. So I'm crucified, but I'm alive. But it's not me anymore that's living. It's Him living in me. You find a limit for me in that. Ephesians 4. You want to look there quick and I'll close. I'm just calling you to something, guys. That little thing, that's real. That little thing I did up here, Neil, when nobody's looking, that's real. That should be a real place for all of us. You should be with unveiled face going after him. 
Everybody has access to his presence. There's not a condemned person on the earth unless they believe condemnation. Then you're not believing mercy and the cross. You got to let the mercy and the cross take you through the condemnation to get to him. That's where freedom is. This, this, this name of this, this ministry, this work, Redemption House. When I first started coming, it was Redemption House. Then it's Redemption House Life Center. I get it, connected. I like the whole thing. But watch. Let's start with the first word, redemption. Brought back or bought back to original value. Redemption. That's the cross. Out of darkness, into light. <laughs> if you say you abide in him and you know him and you remain in him, but you continue to walk in darkness, well, you're lying. You're not practicing the truth. He's not saying you're cut off, you're a hypocrite, you're damned. What he's saying is you're definitely deceived because you're laying claim to a vocal identity that you haven't enjoyed the experience of. So if you're not careful, you hide behind a language and then grace doesn't change you. Whoa. I hope you got that. That's not condemnation. That's an invite. Yeah. He's not making no bones about this. He said, if you say you abide in him and walk in darkness, you lie and you're not practicing the truth, which means it's unscriptural for a Christian to walk in darkness, but nobody's talking about that. Because our experience doesn't let us talk about that. Because it seems to slam the whole room. Yep. <laughs> but if we can't talk about that, then when will we ever receive the grace to actually live that and understand what the man's writing about? <laughs> so look, I love you. I respect you. I mean, I've been here and I actually came back. But I'm not following you. You can't pull me into your experience and make it my reality. I'm following him. I'm following him. My children, when they were in their mid-teens, called a conference with me. When the parent child, it was a child-parent conference. And they said, Dad, you're too much Jesus. I said, what? That's a new one. You're just too much Jesus. I said, what are you trying to tell me? They said, we've been looking around. Even this so-and-so and this so-and-so and this so-and-so. Leaders, they this. And they were finding weakness in people. And they came to me and said, we can't find anybody out there like you. Come on. My own kids. Why were they having this conversation? Because they didn't have in their heart what was in my heart that was making them see what they were seeing. They had other things in their heart. So I'm a violation to those things and a huge hurdle to jump. Because their conscience won't allow them to just this unless they can fix this or resolve this. So if they can bring me into their world, they can go on with their desires without conflict. They said, we, they ain't nobody out there like you, Dad. Now, that's not a slam from your kids. It wasn't because I Bible bashed them. They know how I live without compromise. They're my children. They, they don't hear me shout down their mom. For 28 years, they haven't heard that. Don't tell me it ain't possible. They've never seen me tense towards their mother. 28 years. Eight of those years she was in identity crisis. Struggling, condemned, suicidal. Accusing me of things that would never be in my heart. And they never saw anything different out of me. Why? I ain't never seen anything different out of him. I'm not following you. I love you. But I'm not following you. So I said to my children, I said, this is a tragic shame what you're doing, kids. I said, you're mentioning so-and-so and so-and-so? And so? You've been tracking their life? You've been looking for jot-down stuff to hold this little 
as if you got firepower. But we got a big problem. I'm not following so and so. And I'm not following so and so. And you're saying there's nobody out there that looks like me? Maybe you ought to get back in this book. And see if there's somebody in here that I'm starting to look like. And that looks like me. Because I'm following him. And he's my king. I said, children, I see what you're doing. You're having this talk because you have other things in your heart. And you're trying to jump this hurdle called dad. And I just called him on some things. And we ended the conference. (laughs) And who knows, people will go do what's in their heart. But it's a shame because you got one life and you ought to surrender it and give it back to him. Because the one life you got ain't yours. It was never created to be yours. See, that's the problem. It was created to be him in you. Not him on you and not him for you. Not him to you. Him in you. There's a difference in all those phrases. There's not a person on the earth that was ever made to live their life. He said, if you find your life, you've lost it. But if you lose it for my sake, then you found it. Weren't we all lost? See, he came to seek and save that which was lost. Is he talking about a drunk in a back alley? Is he talking about a woman selling her body to stay high? He's talking about that truth that got lost, that Christ in me, the hope of glory. He came to seek and save that, not who. Something got lost through sin that he came to restore. And we have so related to the flesh and our experiences that we have actually lorded our experiences at the risk of idolatry, made our experiences greater than his grace, which changes me. And there's a language that talks around his grace and keeps us the same. And if you don't talk that language, you ain't keeping it real. You're high-minded. You're not relating. We're not following the crowd. Not even the Christian crowd. We're following Christ. That's what makes us Christians because the word means little Christ like one. Christian doesn't mean I go to a Bible believing church. Christian means I'm a little Christ like one. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you go to Redemption House Life Center, Christian, because I don't even know what that means if you go to Redemption House Life Center. <laughs> Other than you celebrate long. (laughs) Make much of the moment. Invite a man in and give him a mic whenever (laughs) you get around to it. (laughs) And then it's 1014 and it's on me right now. (laughs) I'll get a session afterward so I can get back to freedom. (laughs) Ephesians 4 and I'm done. I'm, I'm sorry it's so late, but just blame the house. Why did in verse 11 he himself give some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers? Why did he do that? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. Uh Uh-oh. Verse 13. Don't miss this language. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Not faith. The faith. When faith is used separate from the word the It's a tool in your belt to move a mountain, to get a new job, to believe for promotion. When the word faith is used without the in, it's just a tool in your belt to live by. But when he puts the word the in front of faith, now it's a universal perspective that the body of Christ should understand. It's a mindset. The faith is a perspective we should all have of who we've become now that he came. How do we resist the devil? Standing steadfast in the faith. 
See, your fight isn't against the devil and it's not against flesh and blood. It's fighting the good fight of faith. It's holding on to that perspective, that truth that's come through him. The fa- established in the faith. Obedient to the faith. Resisting steadfast in the faith. Striving together for the faith. Yeah? Yeah? Till we all come to the unity, it doesn't say of faith, of the faith. Till we all start seeing the same, believing the same, wake up. and See, we're all different. We all look different. We've made so much of that in society, looks. A lot of people have finally gotten free from it. Some people never seem to. Appearance, looks, hair, texture, eyes. Some people are on their fourth nose, third set of lips. Oh, no, it's real. It's real. Look, look, look. We all look different for a reason because it's nothing to do with outward appearance. He gave you a vessel to manifest him through. It's not about looking in the mirror and saying, why did he give me this hair? No, you should look in the mirror and say, I'm so thankful you gave me you. See, because now your hair matters more than what he looks like in you, looks like through you. If you manifested Jesus, nobody would even see your hair. Come on. No, no. If you manifested Jesus. I read Isaiah 53. He had no former comeliness that we should desire him. Ladies, he wasn't a head turner. You weren't like, oh, the Lord. He wasn't a handsome guy. Read your Bible. Probably homely. By the world standards. Has to be. If he's handsome, then we all need to be handsome. And if you throng him, it might be because he's a hunk. They thronged him because he was love. They thronged him because he was the revelation of the Father. They thronged him because deep in their DNA was a hunger for the sons of God to rise up. And all creation's been groaning. They didn't throng him because he was handsome. They thronged him because he was just like the Father. The unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. See how they're connected in the same verse? Who authored our faith? Who perfects it and completes it? Looking unto... He put all things in subjection under our feet, yet we still don't see all things in subjection, but we see... Make sure you keep seeing Jesus. Yeah? Because if all you see is a thing that ain't subjecting... And you get on an issue and tangent with that. Just keep seeing Jesus. Well, I ain't praying for the sick anymore. I pray for three people and they didn't get healed. Well, every time I step out and try to evangelize or do something for God, all hell breaks loose. I ain't stepping out no more. I'm just going to church. You ever hear people talking like this? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect or complete man. uh Uh-oh. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You show me a limit. This isn't my sermon. I'm so safe. This isn't my interpretation. You can't mess this up. Well, that was Jesus. Okay, so grow to the fullness of his measure. Because if the word's saying it, it's possible. And if the word's saying it and calling my faith to it, then grace must be there to oblige faith. The problem is we haven't seen this level of grace because we've been deceived out of believing. Come on. We've so related to our flesh that we've come up with a language to declare where we've been instead of where we're created. Come on. Watch this. To a complete man. To the measure of the stature of the fool. Now we should no longer just keep being tossed to and fro. 
Come on, who can relate to seasons in your life where you didn't lock down and get your heart established in faith and you had a good heart so you stayed in the race, but man, sat down a lot, a lot of refreshments, a lot of breathers, and felt like you didn't even run forward. You feel like you're back at the finish or the starting line. Come on, toss to and fro. The only reason you didn't get out of the race is because you're sincere, but we're destroyed for the lack of knowledge, not the lack of sincerity. You know, the second half of that verse in 6 says, in essence, it says, I gave you the knowledge and you rejected it. Christ Jesus has become the wisdom of God for us. He tells them in Hosea, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge, but it ain't because they didn't have the knowledge. They just rejected what they had. So now they're living rejected because they didn't grab a hold of the answer, the way. Nobody quotes that second half. We all just say destroyed for the lack of knowledge, but I gave them the knowledge and they rejected it. He actually says in most translations, because you've rejected the knowledge, I've rejected you. In other words, I can't live with what I'm not. I can't meet and bless and facilitate what I'm not. I can't meet you where I'm not. I want to bring you where I am. Come up hither. Are you with me? See, we reduce him to just coming to our mess and ministering to us in our mess, but we keep the mess mentality. He wants to get you out of darkness into the light because in him is no darkness at all. He wants the world to see you as faultless and blameless and innocent. Let your light so shine before who? Men. Why? So they see your life and glorify him. They're not glorifying him because you're complaining. They're not glorifying him because you're discouraged. They're not glorifying him because you're frustrated and weary and angry and in unforgiveness. They're glorifying him because you look like him. And it's not just something to be admired. It's something that makes people hungry to become. No more tossed to and fro by all this stuff going on out there and the doctrine and the trick of your men and all the different motives. 15, but speaking the truth in love, watch this, may grow up in all. Not some things. That you may grow up into everything that's possible here in this life, because remember, you see in part, and we don't have a full fix yet, and we can only go so far, brother. You ever hear language like that? I've heard tons of language like that since I've been saved. But when I read my Bible, I don't even see that language anywhere. So we must be preaching our experience instead of him. But speaking the truth in may grow up in into him. All things into him who is the head. And he's Christ. Do you find any limit in that scripture? To the full measure of the stature of Christ grow up into him in all things. Walk in love just as he loved. Walk in the light as he's in the light. Walk. If you say you abide in him, you ought to walk even as he walked. Purify yourself even as he is pure. If you believe in me, the things I do, you'll do. Do you need any more evidence? I mean, there's more scriptures. Or did I give you plenty for 1024 at night? Out the mouths of two or more, every word's confirmed and established. We just gave you like six. The life I live, I live by faith. In the Son of God, I've been crucified, but I live. Yeah? This is what we're called to, guys. How do we get there? Not by trying to get there. You don't do this, you become this. And you have to want to. And I wish I had a more fantastic, powerful, impacting way to end this. But the bottom line is God wants your heart. Because with a heart a man believes, not his head. And if he gets your heart, he gets you. Now the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. It says if a man doesn't stumble in his speech, he's a mature and complete man. 
Yeah. Why? Because there's so much that's come from the tongue, from the inside, that's not him. And it tosses men to and fro. And it's the tongue and who can tame it? It's little member. Guess who can tame it? By you surrendering to Holy Spirit. Because if a man doesn't stumble in speech, which means it's possible to live from a pure reservoir. Or he wouldn't say to the pure, all things are pure. And blessed are the pure in heart. He wouldn't say it if there's no such thing. So I'm calling you to something tonight that he's calling you to. I'm just a messenger calling you to what this book says. Who sees that all I did was read scriptures? I didn't spend any time just just making comments. We just read scripture after scripture, and I commented on the scripture just to clarify the absolute of what it's saying, because that isn't even up for interpretation. When he says walk in the light as he's in the light, I don't need no interpretation. It must be what he meant when he said, follow me. But in Matthew 16, he said the most important thing about this whole topic, if you are going to follow me and you want to, and it's in your heart too, there's something I need from you. You got to deny yourself. Because if you wake up and make it about you, it'll never be about me. And you'll be stumbled and you'll fall and get up and stumble and fall and get up and stumble and fall. And in time, you wonder if you've even gotten anywhere. And you either give up or just get in this form of something without being it. You were never made for you. You were made for his image. I've said it for years. Living for yourself is like putting metal in a microwave. It wasn't made for it. Go ahead and try it and see if it works. Come on, go home, put the fork on the plate and hit it. And tell me if it works. Why? Microwave wasn't made for metal. So why do we go ahead and put the fork on the plate in our lives? Why do we go ahead and live for ourselves when we weren't made for ourselves but for his image and his glory? You cannot come to God for your sake. You have to come to him for his name. You don't come to him just because everything's fallen apart. You don't come to him because your spouse left. You don't come to him because you just lost your job. You come to him so he becomes your life. And in all these things, we can rightly reveal him. You never, ever get tricked into coming to him for what he can do for you. Sermon after sermon after sermon have enticed people to pray a prayer for all those reasons. He is not here to fix the things you broke. Now, he will step in and fix some things. He's here to make you more like him. Who knows if you lost your children through actions, he can fix that. His goal is to put who he is on the inside of you, not just get your kids back. My wife prayed for me to change for 13 years, and I got worse. (laughs) And she got mad. She was in her bedroom, pumped her fist at God and said, I'm done with you. You've allowed me to suffer for 13 years. I prayed for him 13 years and you ain't changed him a bit. He's he's probably worse. You've allowed me and these children to go through hell and you've done nothing. See, pain filled hearts understand her language. Seven weeks later. Well. I got saved five months after that. And then seven weeks later, he delivered her. And the first thing he said to her when she was on the floor crying, it's true you prayed to me for 13 years. 
but you don't realize how you've kept me from moving and changing him according to your prayer because you never prayed because of love. You only prayed because of pain. And you knew if I changed him, it would make your day go better. You never prayed for him because he was lost and didn't know who he was. And I can't answer your prayer and allow you to stay there because it's not me. Now, how many times have we self-righteously, without realizing it, prayed for people because of the problem? Not because of the love. Come on, this thing is real. And if we couldn't live it, he wouldn't call us to it. Amen? Why don't you stand to your feet before we keep losing everybody? Huh? Oh, all right. Well, I knew it wasn't my preaching. It's way too good. It's way too good to walk out on that. I I, I wasn't worried about that part. I just figured you had somewhere better to go. I just figured you had some better to go in your unsurrendered lives. No, no. That's a joke. That's a joke. (laughs) Can we just, can we uh, close this thing out tonight with just a sincere surrender like want to in our hearts? There's so many ways you can go at the end of the service. There's so many things you can pray for and things you can do. Normally on a Friday night, we always pray for the sick. Uh, when I travel, I normally do. I shouldn't say always. A lot of times. But can you right now, it just feels right with a word like that, that was so scripturally backed. Who, who saw the word of God was preaching this sermon? Huh? So watch this. I say this phrase, but now you understand what it means better. Don't sell cheap because you're not for sale. You've been bought with a price and you're not your own. That should convict you by the attitude you carry. That should convict you in every motive you have in every situation. Because in every situation I'm anointed to look like him, not me or not me that confesses him. I'm created to look like him. Not me who confesses him. I'm created to look like him. Are you with me? Then we're rightly representing him. So if Jesus said that we were made for his image through the word, right? And he was there from the beginning and nothing was created or made that wasn't made through him. And the reason God made man was for his image. And he said, follow me. And the things I do, you'll do. Walk in the light as he's in the light. Abide yourself in him and you'll walk even as he walked. You guys got what we did tonight, right? So if Jesus said, when you see me, you see the father and jesus said he's the light of the world at what point then do you see him passing that baton and sending the message hey this ain't just about me being the light this is what you all created for and it's why i'm here to put my life back into you my nature back into you my ways back into you my spirit back into you so you now you now are the light of the world so i'm going to sit at the right hand of the father but you are the light of the world. So let your light so shine before men. That doesn't sound needy, frustrated, counseling appointments, discouraged, unforgiveness, tit for tat. He said, she said, well, I feel, well, I wouldn't if they did. Come on. What's the whole goal of this? If I'm following Jesus, when people see me, who should they see? The Father. Watch. He's the way, the truth, and no one comes to the... What's Jesus paying the price to restore? The image of God in men. That is not a declaration. That is not a confession. That's an expression. That we may be seen as innocent, harmless children. Without fault. See, right there, we lost 99.9% of the sermons with Scripture. 
that we'll be seen without fault. What are you saying, brother? Nobody's perfect. Everybody has faults. Come on. It ain't even about fault because now you're just setting people up to fail and now they're going to be condemned and they're just going to give up altogether. But yet the Bible still says what it says. Is he talking about perfection or is he talking about purity? Because even if they see fault in me and I'm living pure, they're going to see repentance in me. They're going to see how that changes things. They're going to see how I grow up into him. They're going to remember when I used to, but now I. And they're going to remember when I was, but now I. And all of a sudden they see how grace works in a person's life because he surrendered. You'll never live this thing without wanting to. And that's why in the end, we all stand before him. And he set before us life and death. Now will you choose life that you might live? Are you with me? Be a want to when I pray tonight in your heart. I'm not calling you up here. You be a want to. I'm going to pray something believing you got a want to in your heart. Fair enough? So, Father, we come before you. Your word is clear. This isn't high-minded. We are keeping it real. It's what you created us for. It's what you paid for. And it's what you called us to. And your grace is sufficient for us. We didn't set anybody up to fail tonight. Your word set us up to believe. And if we're going to live by faith, we're going to receive grace. And grace is going to save us. And I'm asking that you work so specifically... And so intimate and so personal in each and every one. And take each and every one like a Philippians 13. No matter where and what level we've arrived respectively. Let us all have this same mind. Lord I ask for growth all across this room. I ask for increase. And I ask for greater expression. And with some it might seem more. With some it might seem less. But we're not weighing that. We're seeing change. Transformation. And growth. Till we grow up into you in all things. To the full measure. Let no one in this room grow weary in well doing. Let us hold the plow and never let go and never look back. Lord I'm asking a big thing right now. From my heart it's a big thing. For you it's small. For some it will feel big. Would you teach us tonight how simple it is. To forget what lies behind. Would you empower us. To see that it's irrelevant. What lies behind. And teach us that in Christ. On your timetable. We don't have a yesterday. We have a present. And a things to come. Would you empower some people to let go of yesterday? To see that it's deceiving them, that it's falsely identifying them, that the emotions are just emotions. They can be changed by truth. That nobody can make up for anything. Nobody can pay back what they did or said. Can we just call it dead tonight? And say, I have been crucified with Christ yet I live but it's not I who live it and the life that I now live I live by the faith the perspective and the mindset of Jesus Christ Father empower this room to live Christ empower redemption house life center to manifest you Let them stay wild. Let them stay fun. Let them worship for hours on end. But most of all, let them manifest Christ. Let us see that the greatest joy is being found one with you. With no animosity in our heart. No hidden agenda. Just free and clean bought with a price and our lives are not our own 
Let the attitude of heaven be the attitude of your people. And when they see us, let them glorify you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Pastor. Come on, can you put your hands together? Tomorrow's a glory-filled day. Uh, when you get home or in the morning, I want you to look in the mirror and say, like Papa Dan said, I look like Jesus. I'm homely too. <laughs> so I feel good now. Thank you. So you don't have a... The Word of God's been preached I bless you to just manifest Jesus. Tomorrow we're going to be having an incredible time in the morning at 10 o'clock. We're going to have all day festivities. We're going to have a cookout. Lots of fun for kids, for adults. Uh, we're going to be having a great time. If you know anyone or you're getting baptized, come prepare. No white shirts. Uh, and also then in the evening, we're just going to have a huge celebration. That's what this is about just celebrating Jesus and the accessibility of heaven through the cross, through Jesus Christ, so that we can walk blameless before him. I just bless you as you go. Love on people. What an incredible night. I thank you, Lord, for all you're going to do this weekend. And as we go, Lord, just let the blessing of heaven just remind us, Lord, who we are, how we're so connected in this great union. And love on people as you go. We thank you for coming out tonight. Again, thank you, Dan, for what an incredible word that was. What a challenge to go higher. We accept the challenge. We believe. Amen. Say, I'm a believer. Amen. Be blessed as you go. We'll see you tomorrow.